for joining us today for our exceptional PhD alumni panel. Uh, my name is Hayon Hong, and I'm a graduate career fellow at the Creative Center here, and we'll be moderating this panel. Um, so first, um, I would like to introduce our panelists. So we also have it in the slides. Uh, Caitlin Brown, who is currently the head of business development at Pepper Bio. Uh, Nick Edwards, the founder and CEO at Emergent. Uh, Jaday Okonji, private equity consultant at Bain & Company. Uh, Raquel Sherwood, uh, the regional director, life science specialist at Aventure. And lastly, we have Ryan Chu, the current director of global marketing, strategic planning for operations for general medicine at Amgen. Um, so I'm excited to see this room filled and for uh, panels here to share great insights with us. Um, so we will start with several questions for panelists. And then after that, we'll open it up to the floor for a Q&A session. And following that will be a networking session uh, with lunch uh, for the remaining time. Uh, so that is our plan for today. Um, so I'd like to start off with asking a question about your career trajectories and transitions. So um, our panelists have had different career trajectories after obtaining PhDs. Um, some went directly to business, from R&D to business, and consulting to business and vice versa. Um, so can you please share with us your experiences, uh, motivations, and challenges with transitioning from science to business? Yeah, so um, I graduated um, 2014 from the pathobiology program. Um, I went immediately to a postdoc at UMass Medical School. Um, I was convinced I wanted to be a tenure track research professor, so I spent the whole postdoc, you know, I had a, a long list of publications, fantastic, great, did um, uh, the round of tenure track interviews and then realized a little late in the game that that was not actually what I wanted to do for my life. Um, after a little bit of, uh, well, I'll call it a meltdown, career meltdown, trying to pivot to my next step, um, I took a hard left turn and went into equity research and banking, which basically means you're on a team and you try to advise clients about whether or not they should buy, hold, or sell a stock. So that was a, a very different um, area than I had been in, what I thought I was going to be in. Um, that was not ultimately the game for me. I learned a lot, but equity research was not what I wanted to do long term. Um, but fortunately, I was doing a lot of networking and informational interviews during my time um, at Cowan. And my resume happened to get into the hands of a startup. Um, they were still in stealth mode. They had nothing posted. But because I'd been doing all this networking and my resume was floating around, they reached out to me. Um, I knew I wanted to be on the business side. They needed a head of business development. Um, and it was sort of just a good fortune, good luck that it ended up working out for everybody. So I've been with Pepper about two years now. Um, I head up, well, ostensibly my job is external partnerships, but being at a startup, that means I also do admin, HR, operations, you know, whatever needs to get done, strategy, I do it. Um, because I am the business side of the business at this point. Um, so that's, that's my career in a nutshell thus far. <laughs> I guess we're going down the line. Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm Nick. Um, I, man, transition, which one? Um, <laughs> I've done a lot of different things. And so um, I, after, after I finished my PhD here, I did this joint program between uh, Brown and the NIH. Uh, I finished up in 2016. And uh, I was like pretty convinced I was going to go on to become an academic PI. And, uh, um, and you know, had a pretty strong publication record, felt like it was on track, uh, moved to San Diego and um, uh, picked back up on surfing, which I was uh, doing when I was a kid and, and um, really wanted to kind of live near the ocean. That was like one of the major reasons why I went to UCSD. Um, and and uh, I was out surfing one day and I realized like, uh, I don't know that I wanna like go get a job somewhere random that I don't really wanna live. Um, and that was one of the big uh, deciding factors for me, to be quite honest. Uh, um, so I left, uh, I found out, I, I, was out I, was, I was out with a friend uh, surfing this day, and he was like, well, have you ever thought about consulting? I was like, no, really, like, I don't really know what that is. 
And, um, and so when we talked about it, I uh, met some people at this consulting club at UCSD and, and I ended up getting into Boston Consulting Group. And it was there for a little while. Um, uh, traveled four days a week, um, did some really interesting things, but decided that it wasn't right for my family because it was, was gone a lot. And so um, I moved back to San Diego, uh, spent some time at Illumina. Um, but I've been, I've started companies, been, been working on building companies ever since I was in college um, and really enjoyed that. I started a company as a postdoc um, and uh, jumped off to, to kind of pursue something that was exciting to me and, and uh, startups are certainly exciting uh, in great ways and also in, in really hard ways sometimes. Um, uh, but I'll, you know, just real quick, most recently the, the, the transition, I jumped off from a company about three months ago to start this new company. It, the name is it's actually a stealth company, but I don't know why I put it up there, but uh, <laughs> it's on video now, isn't it? Um, so, so, but, but the, the major thing for me was um, I, I had been building things for other people for lots of years, you know, like at a venture studio and, and uh, uh, fast growth companies. And I was, you know, I really liked that. Um, but like, I always felt like I was doing something that I wasn't quite 100% excited about. And uh, building something new, like starting a new company, that was kind of, was exciting to me. And so um, it's a few months into it and I'll let you guys know where it goes in a couple of years. <laughs> we'll see you in the news. Yeah, <laughs> So unlike uh, Nick and Caitlin, I never had any desire to pursue the academic track. Um, I think halfway through my PhD, it became obvious to me that this was just not a life in terms of a PI. So <clears throat> after I left Brown in 2010, I went into the industry um, right away. And I first worked in like manufacturing, they did R&D, then did product management, and that really was the first transition. It was like, as an R&D scientist, you develop your products, but somebody else is telling you what products to develop. So I wanted to be the person making that decision as to what business direction we're going. And that was my first transition onto the business side, I would say, and trying to look at markets and try to decide what customers actually need and then designing that. And I got recruited into a different company called Dana Hart, student product management, but um, for my specs, which I probably used my specs a total of two times when I was doing my PhD. And I was like, you know, I don't have as much experience in this. And you're like, no, we just need you for the business mind, not really the scientist mind. We have a lot of scientists. Working in Dana Hart really opened my eyes. Um, it's a super successful company. Um, they are known for developing a lot of leaders, like the current head of GE used to be the head of Danaher. And they had this management development program where they just put you in different roles in different industries just to develop a broad skill set so that you can be a senior leader. And I think that's where really I departed from, okay, I'm a scientist, so more like, I just want to be a business leader. I've done a variety of different things, which has positioned me for this. I was on this track of general manager, where I'm going to be CEO or something. And ultimately, I went to get an MBA while working. And a company reached out to me. Now, this was an engineering firm and said, come lead strategy. Like, first of all, I know nothing about engineering, but it sounds good. Let's do it. And that's what I did for a couple of years. But as I was finishing my MBA, um, I had the opportunity to start learning about consulting. And I was like, you know, this sounds interesting. You do a variety of different projects. You work on really high impact really impactful questions for clients, let's go do that. So again, I'm in the midst of a transition. They will describe my career. I like to explore a lot, right? So I think that as you go through your career journey, as you begin it, think, don't pigeonhole yourself, right? There's a lot of different things that you can do with the skill sets you're developing, and that's what I've always sought to do. So uh, Raquel, um, so I've had, I guess, many careers. Uh, and I was talking with someone, these gentlemen before, saying that probably I've had about four careers. And I think a lot of times we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to, when we get to this critical point, we're thinking about like our entire rest of our lives. And I, I always discourage folks from thinking that way because it's fair enough you might change your career every four to six years and, and go on a different path. So that's okay. Um, I mean, 
so I'll, I'll tell you about my trajectory. So I started off uh, after undergrad. Undergrad, I worked as a cytogenetic technologist. So I worked in a genetics lab diagnosing um, genetic abnormalities. Came to grad school after I left here. I came to grad school, wanted to be faculty, wanted to be tenure track faculty. Um, I struggled. Um, I struggled all the way through, not with the science, not with the work, but just like me, like not being very, very happy um, during graduate school. Um, and I always loved science, but I didn't know how to apply the skill set that I had to whatever else I wanted to do. Um, so what ultimately happened was that I realized the type of stress in academia, I could not be happy um, under that type of stress. The publications, the compete, the, just the constant competitions for grants. Like, you know, when people would have a big paper, like they get really excited about it. I had a couple of big papers. I was like, I never got excited. I never celebrated. I was just on to the next thing. And that's probably like the, just the wrong energy, right? So um, I ultimately decided that this was not for me, but this was like right at the end of my postdoc. So, Right at the end, I had a frantic panic worry about like, what am I gonna do um, after I leave? Um, I talked to my, I ended up talking to two, so a good friend, my best friend, and then um, my PI at Yale. And he basically said, I told him that I was you know, gonna go back to school and get an MBA. So what my PI said was, he's like, don't go back to school immediately. He's like, look for a job, be in that job for two years, and at that point decide if you wanna go on and pursue an MBA. He said, you know, you want to make sure that you like it. And number two, if you get a job at the right company, they're going to pay for it. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So I ended up at VWR um, back then as a life science specialist, uh, supporting the technical applications of the life science portfolio. So everyone knows VWR or Bonchor for tips and tubes and glass flasks and things of that nature. But we have an entire, we sell, there's like 3 million SKUs in our portfolio. We sell absolutely everything. We're the Amazon of the lab world. Um, so because the portfolio is so large, they have scientists uh, dedicated to different parts of the portfolio. So life science, analytical chem, bioprocessing, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we hire in um, a, a couple of si or scientists uh, to support the business overall. Um, I never saw myself in the path of like sales because when I was at the bench, I truly disliked when the salespeople came to the lab <laughs> because they were disruptive. They didn't know what they were talking about. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a betrayal. I'm going to be one of those people. Um, but I made it a point to like not be one of those people, to like, you know, research who I was talking to and like not be disruptive so that I could actually help um, my customers and the people that I was supporting. Um, so I was there for a while. I was like the top rep um, in North America for years. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to transition into the part that I love most about the job, and that's essentially business development. So just, so for me, like I joke and say that like, I'm a full-time busybody, I'm a part-time hustler, because like, I want to know what everybody's doing, so that's the busybody part. And the hustler part is like, know what you're doing, and then telling you that you want something that you may or may not want, and convincing you to buy it, right? So, and I, you know, I'm ethical, so I'm not going to sell you something that you don't actually need, but that's like the joke that I tell my family. Um, so uh, I found a business development role at Kaijin supporting essentially the East, East Coast. We, were, we had a business strategy focused on selling gene therapy companies, so that was my arena that I um, helped guide uh, the Northeast team to find uh, opportunities and companies and customers. Um, I was recruited back to Avantour, which is VWR. We were acquired by Avantour um, into a leadership position as the regional director um, of the East Coast team, the life sciences scientist team. Um, so I manage um, a territory from Maine down into Northern Virginia. I have nine direct reports who are all scientists that have jumped over the sales side. And we support another team of about 120 people. And those are the, the sales reps that come into your labs and ask you all these ridiculous questions. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that's where I am now. Um, I probably will stay here for a little while because I'm, I'm really happy in this role. That's great. And I'm Brian. I graduate also from pathobiology from 2018, uh, my journey is similar, but a little bit different. I did want to be in academia, be a scientist, that's why I came to grad school to start my PhD, but what I didn't know in undergrad, I was doing plant uh, pathogens, and switching to grad school pathobiology, I was starting doing animal models, and that was a little bit of uh, a shocking transition for me, so after a while, <laughs> 
I also realized I'm probably not going to be the best scientist in the world. I realized my potential is limited. So I was determined to find a job that didn't require me to be in the animal facility. <laughs> and I uh, had a couple of friends uh, in Boston area, and they were in the consulting um, world already. Uh, so got pulled into that space. So after grad school, I also joined consulting world, uh, and joined PCG, uh, similar to Nick, I believe. We never met in PCG days, but um, and in PCG, I, I learned. I think it was a great uh, opportunity and experience for me, um, but I didn't feel the passion for the job, to be honest. Um, I was branding, but didn't feel like, man, I love this. Um, so I want to go back to something you know, science-related. didn't require me to be in the lab, uh, but also I can feel something I personally uh, connected to. I can feel the passion for it. So, I was looking for a couple opportunities and the Amgen uh, came um, to me, actually, uh, they were, before COVID, right before COVID, they were looking for someone who um, could be, you know, bilingual, but also, you know, ability to travel and uh, set up some international um, um, operations uh, for our oncology business. So that's the role I was originally hired for. So, and within Amgen, since COVID, I switched several roles um, so from that I got put into a sort of a chief of staff operating um, role for our CEO staff office uh, after a couple of years and that opened a lot of doors internally through network and experiences and that got me here uh, into the global marketing side um, for the cardiometabolic we call it gen med, uh, general medicine business so um, that's where I am um, I'm still at the very beginning of my career path, happy to share, uh, but take everything I said with a grain of salt. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing your experiences. I think, as Raquel mentioned, I also had a panic at some point of like, where, yeah, there was the one career that like I, I should start with, or like, I felt like that would be a continuing that career, at least in my mind, like the 10 plus years. But I know like, that's not the case now, and because all of you have come through career change. I feel like we all like feel that at some point, and now we, you know, yeah, we can just transition. Um, so uh, next, I would like to ask um, about your experience and your career positions. Um, so, what are your current roles and responsibilities, and what do you enjoy most about your job, and what's the most challenging? Let's start. Go for it. Well, since I just oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So right now, I'm in global marketing. So in our company, in typical large biotech pharmaceutical companies, you have a global team and a US team for commercial operations. And I'm on a global side. Um, and I work for the cardiometabolic area, meaning uh, covers cardiovascular drugs like LDL lowering, um, cholesterol lowering, or um, you know, bone you know, franchise uh, increase of EMD. Uh, we also have neuroscience, nephrology, and we also have obesity and metabolic uh, pipeline, meaning the drugs have not launched into the market. So what we do is uh, try to partner with other functions such as clinical development, uh, early research, uh, regulatory affairs, uh, manufacturing operation, supply chain, to make sure we have a holistic point of view about the program potential and operation of the inline market products so we can support them to serve patient, um, and by serving patient, meaning you not only have a drug that can be efficacious and safe, but also uh, you can pass a regulatory hurdle, and you can also manufacture at a reasonable cost, and you can actually market and sell the drugs to the patient, because if the drug is good, but you cannot deliver it into patient's hand, we're not serving the patient. So, on marketing side, we sort of coordinate. We also we like to think we're coordinating uh, and helping to uh, shepherd the inline products and pipeline programs. For me, uh, my job mostly um, about strategic planning. Meaning, we help I help our cross-functional vice presidents to plan out their period area development area for the long term, looking at 10, 15 years out. Um, 
depending on the big you know, uh, external forces, such as inflation reduction and but also our internal innovation, and uh, scan, partner with our business development colleagues to scan the external innovation landscape and help craft some sort of strategic plan uh, and dealing with uh, many challenges, but also find opportunities. <coughs> what I love most about my job is being able to work with a lot of experts so I can tap into their expertise, I can learn from them, tell me more, tell me why do you think XYZ is good or bad or not sure, what's the challenge you're facing, and I think the learning opportunity I'm given at this moment is so great, uh, I really enjoy it. Of course, uh, do you want to ask challenges or anything? Yeah, be creative. Well, I think the challenges, I think, um, for me, you still need to find a definitive career path, which is probably very hard to find and define, uh, I think. So I still need to explore by learning and figure out what's my next step along the journey within Amgen or biopharmaceutical industry in general. Um, so I'll stop here. But. Awesome. So I guess I'll go next. Uh, so um, in my role, so what the life science specialist team does is that, you know, like I said before, we kind of uh, support the technical applications of our life science portfolio at PWR slash at Bontour. Um, what does that mean, right? So I think, again, most of when I was in lab, I just knew PWR for tips and tubes, but um, we sell absolutely everything. So um, what we are tasked with, what my team is tasked with doing is, is supporting scientists like you, uh, supporting scientists at Amgen. Um, going out and talking to them, understanding a little bit about their work, understanding if they're having any trouble or pain points, and just kind of connecting the dots and trying to support them. Um, so that's what we are, that's what the team is tasked to do. Um, the folks on my team, um, when I'm bringing folks on, I want them to have a solid molecular biology foundation, um, and that also comes with other skill sets like, I don't know, cell culture, uh, genomics, or proteomics, uh, those types of those types of that type of knowledge um, with that type of and then of course like everyone that comes into my team everyone that joins my team um, or like our, our national team everyone comes in with their strengths right so um, we're going out and meeting customers that are doing awesome things that no one has ever done before and they're asking us really critical or, or technical questions so as you can imagine we can't answer half of the questions that we get asked but we have to figure it out and, and respond to our customers and, and try to do our best to help them out. So that's what the team does as a whole. Um, and there's, of course it is a sales job, so there's a number that uh, folks have to uh, grow the business every year. So in my role currently, uh, that's what my team does. In my role currently, um, I essentially lead that team. Um, and it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of coaching, so I have a so the folks that tend to come on to be come on to the art teams at VWR um, as specialists, they tend to be um, kind of right out of the lab, actually. So they don't really have you come in knowing a lot about your science, but you don't really know very much about the business side and how to sell and how to analyze data to understand how you can be best supporting your your customers. So I spend a lot of time coaching to that showing, uh, teaching my folks how to look to data, how to use the internet and various resources to understand how we can uh, support our customers. So that's a lot of what I do. Um, and I'm also responsible for the entire, like, you know, the, the financial aspect of our entire life science uh, sales in the East Coast, which globally in my region is the most important region strategy-wise and number-wise for, for the organization. So challenges. I've been in this role now for six months, and my biggest challenge right now is like time, maybe a little bit of work-life balance. Um, but it's just, it's for me, it's just part of growing. And I, the job that I had before in business development, like it was a great job, um, but I needed a new challenge. So this job is, is definitely much more challenging. Um, I'm traveling a whole lot more, and that, that just adds another layer of complexity. But I wouldn't call any of that challenges. It's just all learning, which is what I want to do, what I wanted to do in the first place. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I do right now, um, 
I mean, if you think about a consultant firm, they're providing advice for you. Somebody's trying to make a decision, trying to do something, and they want opinion from people who you think are really smart or understand the industry. So that's one. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is problem solving. So for private equity in particular, these clients are trying to buy another company. When they're trying to buy a company, there's a hypothesis or a thesis around what they're going to do with the company to increase value. So maybe they're going to improve operations, they're going to carry out some more m and activity to make the company bigger. Well, whatever it may be, um, they're coming to us to say, provide an opinion on, we're gonna buy this company and this is our thesis on how to improve the value of the company, what do you think? And how we get to an opinion is really just like a problem solving exercise. What is the market going to do in the next five to 10 years? So build a market model for that. Um, what are people saying about this company? So we talked to a bunch of experts and what exists in the secondary literature about this company. And then we try to synthesize all of that and say of this like five deal thesis, we think thumbs up for this two, maybe you're overestimating um, this third one and this two we sort of disagree with. So ultimately that's what I do, right? Trying to get to an answer on a thesis about the potential purchase of the company. Uh, it's a lot of fun, right? Because every four weeks or so, I'm looking at a new asset, so it keeps it interesting um, in that way, which I like. Um, it's really cool going from day zero or day one, where you're like, okay, what is this asset? What is the industry? To three weeks later, being a pseudo expert on the asset and the industry. Um, some challenges actually include just the hours, right? So consulting is not for very long hours, so work-life balance can be a challenge. Um, but as long as you go into it with your eyes wide open, it's fine. And I think uh, there's a lot of move towards making it more sustainable, so that's um, a benefit as well. And sustainable just means uh, better hours or more manageable hours, more predictable hours, so that has been good. <coughs> Fortunately, I haven't done a lot of traveling to this point, so that also makes it sort of good, but yeah, the challenge is just the hours. Yeah. But it is less than a PhD program, so. <laughs> yes. Yes. so if you're going from this to so it might be like a vacation. And the pay's a lot better, <laughs> yeah. pay's a lot better too, so you get compensated for it. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit better. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what do I do? Um, so I, I uh, think I, I said I, I started this company about three months ago, um, and uh, it's been it's been really interesting. I mean, when you, so when you're starting a company, you do everything, uh, which is just the reality, and and uh, that that has to do with uh, coming up with an idea. Betting that with a lot of people, like having a lot of conversations with investors, having conversations with potential customers, um, uh, and and then starting to build a product. And I, so, you know, big part of your role as as a, a founder of a company is finding other people that want to work with you, and like that are excited, to have have relevant experience. And so that's that, that's a, that's a big aspect. Is like you know, just it's really a lot of relationship building. And so um, I, you know. I, I go to, I host a lot of events um, in San Diego area. Um, I, I do some other things to kind of uh, um, market what I what I do and and, and talk about the story. But um, and then uh, and then you know in that networking is you know you're you're looking at people across a number of different types of functions. So so you know a lot of it is relationship building. It's um, uh, kind of ideating and getting to a stronger idea of what you're going to have so you can actually be credible when you talk to investors uh, and when you talk to customers. Uh, we closed our first investor uh, two days ago. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm super excited about it. And um, they are actually like a, a co-founder with us, essentially. So um, it's with the uh, Allen Institute of AI. And, um, and so that's, you know, it, it's, it's exciting to like see the, you know, a team grow, it's exciting to see like a product start to mature. It's really exciting to like, you know, I, the, the best part to me about starting a company is like, you get to be involved in all the parts that you want to, and then try and outsource anything you don't want to do. Uh, but you know, you have to do everything at first. Um, so it's very wide ranging. Uh, um, I think 
you know, I'm very inspired by people that are coming out of PhD programs and, and doing this and starting companies. Like I, I did not have that confidence and I don't, and I don't think that I, I would have been ready to do that directly. Uh, for me, it's been a, a, a accumulated knowledge across a number of different companies and types of positions. And it's taken me a while to actually figure out like, I'm actually not that great of a corporate employee. Like, <laughs> like I, I, I do things and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm productive, but like, I'm a little bit opinionated and I like to like, I, I like to do things my own way. And so, um, you know, it took some time for me to figure that out and to realize that like starting a company is actually the right, was the right move for me. Um, I mean, the, the, there's, of, of course there's challenges in starting a company and, and um, I mean, but there's challenges in, in all aspects of it. I think that the, the biggest challenge it's actually, I mean, it's a, it's a feature as well. It's like, you have to structure your own day. Like, there's nobody telling you what to do, you know? Like, you don't even, you don't know what to do. And so like, you know, are you gonna rely on chat GPT? Like you have to, or like, you know, talking to other people, like, you have to, really having that network is super important because, because uh, even if you have built companies before, every single time it's new. And every, every time the requirements of what you're building change. Uh, and and the, project, the product changes as well. And so, there's a level of flexibility that, that's required. Um, it just happens to kind of fit my personality. So, I like it. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, relationships, I'm going to echo what Nick said. Relationships are sort of the key. So I'm, I'm in business development, but that, that title kind of covers so much ground from position to position. And being at a, not as new as you, but a fairly new startup, we're two years old now. Um, I, I do everything. So my, as I said, my primary role is in external partnerships, which involves a lot of relationship building, um, finding those internal champions within companies to, to set up projects with, um, but also do a lot of strategy. So I'm building forecasting models, you know, which indication should we go into? Um, what kind of medication should we develop given the IRA that really has an impact on are we going to do a small molecule or are we going to do something different like a biologic with an antibody? Those have you know, those are 10 year projects working down the line. Like what's gonna be the best choice for the company? I find those kinds of questions really exciting. Um, I also, similar to you, I would not be a good corporate employee. I, I don't do well being managed. Um, the great thing about my role is that I'm given a goal and then I'm like set loose, you know, figure it out. Nobody knows, you gotta figure it out. So I have these contacts now, these relationships where I can go and say, Kim, I have no idea what kind of milestones I need for this, this deal, like help. And so I have people I can reach out to for that. Um, we have a great legal team, thank God, who can vet some of these stuff because, you know, like looking at um, some of these patents, I'm like, I have no idea if this patent can be extended. I should not be making that decision. Um, so having a great legal team to back you up, really helpful, but you're just kind of thrown in the deep end. Um, learning so much. I mean, they talk about learning from a fire hose and that is absolutely true. Um, and it's fantastic. Every day is different. I do random things sometimes. You know, I've done a lot of admin. Our CEO can't wait to get into executive assistant because he hates HR and he hates admin. So that's his first thing he wants to get covered. Um, but I do blog posts for social media. Like I should not be in charge of social media, but I am. Um, so stuff like that, you know? you know, these random pieces of the business that you're responsible for, and no one's gonna tell you how to do it, because nobody knows how to do it. This is our first startup together, you know? So you just gotta go out there and get it done. Yeah, that's the, that's the great thing about it. Um, the, the hardest thing is the lack of resources. So you really have to be proactive. You really have to go find this stuff, because, um, yeah, it's on you. Thank you all for your responses. Um, heard some great insights. Um, so with that, I'd like to go on to our final question. Uh, so success in academia and business require different mindsets. Um, what were some steps that you took in order to cultivate a business mindset? And would you have any advice to grad students and postdocs here today on cultivating that kind of mindset from an ongoing person's perspective? Yeah, for me, it was a really abrupt transition. So I went from tenure track focus to finance equity research. And that was like hardcore, dropped in the deep end, you gotta go. Um, and the, the biggest transition for me was the speed. 
Like you can take your time in academia, you can think about stuff. If you have to write a note for clients, you gotta write it in two hours. And it had to be right, because people were making financial decisions on the, based on this stuff. So you had to be right, you had to be fast, you had to be perfect. Um, that, was, that was rough. <laughs> that was rough. So that was, you know, again, being dropped in the deep end. And that has carried through, though. I have learned, I learned so much about how to make models, how to make forecasting decisions based on this information. Um, but the speed and the intensity and the implications of these decision-making processes, that's been, that's been a leap. Yeah, uh, I 100% agree. It's like it's definitely a big transition. Um, and uh, so, you know, when I when I started at BCG, I, I I'd worked in business for a couple of years before I during undergrad to pay for school and and uh, um, and but when I when I started at BCG, it was uh, what they do is um, they have like a two weeks. I think it was a two week training where they flew us out to this fancy place with a bunch of other PhDs and MDs or lawyers. That that word. Barcelona? Barcelona. I got to go to Barcelona. <laughs> they put me to Boston. Yeah. <laughs> they switch it. It's like, yeah, I got, I got the lucky one. Um, so yeah. And, and, uh, it's, it's this business essential program is what they call it. And, uh, um, I remember going in and being like, whoa, like there's all this pre-reading material, like, you know, hun like hundreds of pages of stuff from what I remember, but like, uh, everyone else had read it. I hadn't really, uh, <laughs> very, very closely. And, um, uh, I remember just feeling like, whoa, it's like way too much information. And, and, um, and, uh, it was really helpful to get that, but like, uh, most of the learning came actually on the job and, um, you know, it took about, uh, I, I think that but what people at a consulting firm will often say for PhDs is like it takes maybe six to nine months to like ramp up to get up to speed where you're like, you feel like you really know what's going on. Whereas like maybe someone with an MBA, it takes like four to six months or something like that, uh, slightly less. But um, the performance is the same in the long run. Like, I mean, because what you learn in a PhD is, and, and uh, in science in general is so translatable to anything you do across industry. Um, and, you know, there are like little facts and like learning, learning how to understand a balance sheet or like, you know, uh, being able to read annual reports. It's, yeah, those are important things to learn, but they're not something that you can't do because you've already learned way harder things. And, and uh, you, have a, you have a method for hypothesis testing that like, especially in consulting, um, it actually gave a leg up for a lot of like PhDs uh, that that were working in consulting because you know in, so, in some business schools they teach you to understand frameworks which is like if I have this problem I'm going to solve it with this this and this and this you know whereas like a PhD is very much more kind of like ground up thinking and hypothesis testing and that's actually where you find a lot of value and that's and, and that's what a lot of the you know great consulting firms teach you to do and so um, I think you've already got a lot of uh, skill sets and, and thinking that will translate. It's just like the, the charter, you know? Yeah. I think for me, some of the things that come to mind is, um, I think speed to output has already been mentioned, right? Especially in a consultant firm. Um, you need to, like, you get a deal today and you're already, like, creating answers today, right? It's not, you don't have a lot of time. I think another thing is like the threshold of getting to an answer is much lower. So in the PhD, you have all the time to try to answer the question. And in the consultant firm or in industry in general, you have constricted amount of time. So you have to recognize that you're not gonna get to a 100% answer, right? But uh, you're smart enough to get to a decent and answer that is sufficient for the situation. And I think that the only other thing I would that readily comes to mind is the extent to which there's different amount of stakeholder management. So if you're working in, at least for my PhD, right? Um, yes, you're working among a team, but really it's just you and your PI. You have your own project. And um, in industry or in business, uh, usually you're working as part of a team and the whole team has to be pulling together in order to achieve the results. So you have to manage those relationships. You have to make sure everybody's on the same page, right? And I think that's a mental model shift and a skill set that one has to develop in a business environment. So I'm gonna probably be a little bit different. So, the, so I think 
I think of a business mindset is really understanding your strengths and your skill set and being co confident in them and knowing how you can use a skill set to bring value to whoever you're working with, your customers, your colleagues, your clients. Um, so for me, like, you know, leaving grad school, I just spent my entire time in grad school and, and postdoc, like, doubting that I was doing enough, that I was smart enough, that I could figure everything out. Um, but then I got my first job at, at BWR and I realized that you just have to know enough and you have to know enough quickly um, and just be confident in your ability to kind of figure things out as you went along the way. And understanding that, you know, that ability to figure things out um, does bring a value to the people that you're talking to. And that's 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 kind of the way that I think about it. Just, you know, you just look at your look at yourself, know what you can do, and know how what you can do can help others. Yeah, I agree with everyone. I think for me maybe um, maybe there's just two two um, aspects. The first is I think leverage your sense of dream. Um, I think being a PhD, we're all very analytical, mm -hmm. we're problem solvers. So we already have this, you know, capability to solve problems, trying to find out information, right? No one's chasing you to read papers, you can find out information anyway. And uh, you have an ability to structure in a logical manner, say why things happen in X, Y, Z. So you have this growth mindset, learning agility. So leverage that in any, any job you do, I think will be perfectly fine. Um, I, I would like to make a hypothesis, I think the second aspect is, you know, none of us like to deal with um, politics. <laughs> like not a corporate employee, you know, you know, stakeholder management, I think, you know, uh, same maybe a little client sometimes. So I think politics uh, surrounds us. So um, in a very transparent way. So for me, I think it's something as a PhD, including for me, myself, right now, I'm learning and growing in that aspect as well. I didn't want to work with animals, but I have to work with people. <laughs> um, so I think having that kind of also apply some of the learning and growth mindset now, trying to understand people's behavior and your relationship uh, counterparts and why do they behave in a certain way, I think it will help all of us uh, go a long way Thank you so much for your responses. Um, so we've heard some great insights from um, our panelists. And now um, I would like to open it up to the audience to see if we have any questions. Um, so does anyone have questions to ask their speakers? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this is sort of a quick one, I guess. Um, it sounds like for most of you, business wasn't part of some sort of grand master plan. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if there was anything, if you could cast your mind back to grad school, is, is there anything that you wish you would have done or could have done that would have either pushed you or prepared you for a career in business? I don't know what you guys are doing right now. <laughs> I didn't go to anything, literally, not a single thing. Like I was 100% focused on academia and, and just like opening up the lens a little bit and figuring out, I mean, there's like, Look, I started a podcast a few years ago, actually, about this very subject to interview PhDs that had gone on to different uh, um, career paths. And um, and I found out a lot through that process. I've interviewed like 80 or so people, and, and like it's been eye-opening to me. There's actually a lot of resources out there. And uh, it's just a question of like, is it, some, is it something that you're willing to kind of like put some focus on, I would say, because uh, you still want to keep the focus on your research, I would say. Is my opinion. Like, do the research, like, be exceptional in your field, uh, and and uh, whether that translates to an academic career or something else, great. But like, know what's out there because there's not there there's a lot of options, and business is just one of them. Yeah. If I can offer a different point of view, mm -hmm. I would say uh, this is always here. You can always transition to business anytime in your life. It's always here. I think give yourself a chance. I know my potential is very limited, but I think your potential is unlimited. <laughs> so uh, I would say try to pursue your passion. Find out if you really like the science you do and you really enjoy it, or do you really want to switch? Because it's a one-way street. Once you give up science, it's very hard to come back to the lab in academia. 
Some people can do them in a couple of decades um, <laughs> into a different department, maybe, like business school, um, which we don't have. Uh, I think just give yourself one more chance, pressure test, you know, if you really want to switch. And the other thing is, you know, networks, you know, any project, you know, focus mostly on your academia journey first before you fully transition. Let's know while in grad school, to the extent possible, understand what resources are available within Brown. Is it a consulting club? Is there a business club? And sometimes that may exist primarily in the underground realm, and sometimes you can tap into that, right? And I think that towards the end of just learning, right, like um, you mentioned, your primary role here is to do the research, so focus like 90, 95% of that. But I would say if you're at all curious about things that exist beyond um, academia, which as you, most of you are, if you are here, then I'll put in conscious effort and say, is it two hours a week I'm gonna spend either having an informational interview or being part of some club or being, because the time goes by. And I think your time we, at Brown is very finite. So to the extent that while here, you can take advantage of whatever resources or create new resources that you think will benefit people who are maybe sharing a similar interest as you. I think that would be very good. Yeah, to give a specific example, go to your tech transfer office, intern there. Um, I kind of wish I'd done that now, being on the media side. You can also do something like, that was to take a little bit more time, you can study for the securities exchange um, and introductory exams, the SIE. You can take those and get a sense of the financial landscape. You know, there are little things you well, SIE is not a little thing, but you can do these things yeah, to prep yourself. Series six sixty seven. No, don't do that. Don't don't take the eighty six eighty seven. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that now. Um, but you can you can sort of look at these things, get a sense of okay, what would this be like without jumping a whole hog like I did, just kind of almost blindly. Um, so there are there are specific things you can do. You yeah. know, join clubs, take exams. You know, intern at tech transfer office. I think in my lab, somebody actually interned at like a ventures thing. Yeah, you can so. do both. You can do yeah. fellowships at the VC funds too. Yeah, and that's internal. Like, to the extent that your lab allows you, you can do programs outside as well. Whether it's internships, whether it's one week or a few months, right? So you can do that to explore. If not for anything else, it might increase your conviction that, you know what, that science thing is really what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's just like, it's like a hypothesis testing here. It's yeah. like, you just get involved with anything, something that you're interested in. It doesn't matter. Like it could be like volunteering for a little for a community organization. Like I've seen PhDs transition to, you know, not any number of different things just because they got involved with something that they got they were interested in. It turned into something else and something else. And it's yeah. like yeah. Yeah. And don't informational interviews. People love to help. Yes. Like as long as you say, I'm a student, I'm interested in this, ninety percent of the time people are like, Oh my god. Amazing. I want to share with you my fantastic industry. Let me talk to you about it. So never hesitate to send out cold emails, cold LinkedIn requests. A lot of people actually do want to help you. So and I'll say that I sent out to you when I was trying to, when I had that crisis, I sent out two emails on LinkedIn. And both of those people volunteered 45 minutes, half an hour, and just talked to me about their jobs. Um, and if someone sent me an email to do that, like I would do that for them because that's yeah. that's no soil off my back, right? So I'll definitely send one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have one next week. I'm talking to someone who's at, at Harvard and like I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. So you yeah. know, yeah. people really we, actually want to help. We've been there, right? So. Oh yeah. <laughs> we know the struggle and the panic that comes with that. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, kind of a follow-up to that and like Brian you were mentioning like business is always there but it can be hard to go back um, as someone like I'm in grad school I'm interested in business but I also don't want to close any doors um, I guess the question is do you all like would you recommend a postdoc um, in in that it would I guess provide maybe yeah, not not closing doors. <laughs> so it depends. It depends. I will, I will offer my perspective, but depends. For me, I didn't want to do postdoc because I I was in immunology and I have a time gap. Um, for a postdoc to have a meaningful postdoc, I would have three to five years annual studies. Blah, blah, blah. That would be too much time for me to take, and I didn't want to do it. So. 
for you, I don't know what's your major, how long the typical course are. Some course are is one year, some course are two years, right? Depending on how much time commitment you want to put to that. Um, the only advice is if you want to do it, just do it well. I, even on the industry side, people sometimes still look at your academic achievements, at least in the biotech industry. Uh, I think that matters. So just, I don't know, I don't know what the video is on, but I'm about to say, I, don't, I can't find a better word. Just don't half pass it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did a very long postdoc. I did a five year postdoc. I loved the bench, I loved the lab. I was convinced I wanted to be a tenure track professor. Um, so you can take time. I mean, there's no rush, right? You're, you know, still early in your career, very early. You can change your mind at any point. You, I've seen, you know, associate professors change their mind and go to business, right? There's no, there's no time point. On that. We, we have a new vice president for global development, current development for cardiac and metabolic drugs, and he was a tenure track cardiologist professor at. Um, Duke for like 20, 25 years. Yeah. And I have another example for you. We have another uh, early development uh, medical scientist. She had a 25 year tenure professorship at Stanford and she has been at Amgen for another 20 years. So I was, <coughs> she has the best, you know, you have so many years left and uh, <coughs> look how Amgen has developed uh, over the last 20 years. She grew with our company and uh, she oh. made a lot of impact on patients. I will say, uh, I also did postdoc, not not five years, but um, I think that from my perspective, uh, a postdoc is mostly helpful in getting you an academic job. Like you can you can probably get at any job, and as long as you prepared and as long as you built a network, you can get most any job with a PhD that you can get with a postdoc. So if you know that you want to switch, like start thinking about it early. And, and you can use the postdoc as an opportunity to kind of delay that if you're at the end and you're like, I just need to do something now because I need to make some money. And, um, and, and so I, I went into my postdoc also thinking academia is gonna be the path, but I also uh, was very conscious about it in the labs that I chose. And I, so I think that you know, what you can do is find either labs that are doing some sort of uh, industry applications or like they spun off companies. And there's a lot of labs that, that they're, they're entrepreneurial labs, for example, or uh, go to a place where there's an industry, like I went to San Diego, partly because I knew the biotech industry was really strong in San Diego. So if academia didn't work out, then I could, uh, it might be easier to build a network there. Um, so uh, that was kind of the Yeah, but if, if you already made a decision to switch, yeah. like my yeah. yeah, don't bother. I was like, yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that the um, path to business development on the client side is usually through consulting. Um, so you start out as a consultant and then you go to the client side. But I haven't really noticed a lot of opportunities to directly uh, enter this step in, um, you know, in like an uh, R and D company unless you have a very specific uh, form of expertise. So I was wondering, you know, how does one go about locating those opportunities and uh, you know, any comments? Yeah, so as the BD person, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you don't want to have any background, you're probably going to start off with a search and evaluation type role um, at a major pharma company. Um, and then you can build up from there. You do, if you're coming into a startup like me and you are business development, you are going to have to have some prep. So if I didn't know how to, you know, do strategy model and didn't have the sort of the landscape awareness, I would have really struggled. Um, but if you want to start off at a sort of, you know, mid cap type company and go up from there, there are positions. You just need to have the network to get them because they're really sought after roles. Yeah. Yeah, I can add to that a little bit because yes, I don't do BD now, but prior to going to Bay, and I was waiting the BD offer. Um, and the consultant offer. I think you do need specific skills, so I think it's hard to go from a PhD to that directly, but you need to have, have the skills somehow by getting some experience, right? Whether it's the strategy which I was doing or something related to that, because in the end, that's primarily what BD is, looking at white spaces and thinking, 
what the best growth opportunities are for the company. So in the experience. Sales is another way to do it, though, right? Yeah. yeah. So so I, so from the other side, from the sales side, I, I was business development for for Kaijin, um, for a very specific area. Um, and what helped me was the sales role that I had before. Just going out there, meeting customers, and understanding the landscape, and understanding what was important to customers. With that knowledge from working in sales, um, when I went over to Kaijin, I could develop a plan or strategy to say, okay, this is what these customers are doing, and this is what they need to do, what they need to do it more effectively, right? But it just came from being out and just grinding in sales and talking to customers and understanding what they're doing, what wasn't going well, and then taking that knowledge and going and saying, okay, well, we can help them by doing X, Y, and Z, and then just targeting and chasing them down. Just to add, I think that when I hear business development, that can be a bunch of things. It can, it can. Right, so I think what Raquel does is more like commercial yes. business development. Yes. Yes. I, I don't know whether yours is commercial or more like strategic business strategic, development. But also so I was more on the like strategic, I was speaking more to strategic business development yeah. versus commercial business yeah, development. Still, yeah. Right, so for commercial business development, it's more like, I mean, you can speak best to it, but we have an account or we have a territory. How do we increase, let's say, sales there? Right, and that's very tactical. And yeah. strategic business development is more like, okay, where should this company be playing yeah. three to five years? Right, yeah. and what are the white spaces that we can explore? When someone has business development in their title, look at the rest of the title. And the type of company they work for. Yeah, right? yeah, that'll tell you a lot about what they do. Do you have more questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I'm actually a first year neuroscience PhD student. Um, and so I'm, yeah, so I'm uh, <laughs> still in the process of like thinking about what kind of lab I want to join. And so, um, I mean, they do touch on this a little bit, but I was wondering, do you think it matters like what, um, what do you study in your PhD as far as it being like more basic or like maybe slightly more translatable? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it depends on it. I. I didn't think about that stuff at all. <laughs> <laughs> I did whatever. Yeah, I'm like, also not like completely sure. No, but I, I'm just like interested. It's, in, it's, um, a, either or so. it's a great question. Like when I said, I don't. I didn't think about it. I didn't have enough foresight to think about. I guess you know, like uh, um, I think that that uh, um, I, I went after. I think I think primarily from my perspective, like in a PhD, do what excites you, and like what is going to be like. Oh, this is. Like, this question is gonna like keep me going for multiple years because it's hard to finish and it's hard to like, it, it's just hard to do, uh, and so um, something that will engage you. But um, you know, I I I do think that um, you know, looking back, there's actually other questions and things that I think are super interesting that like I never explored. And so um, you know, if I'd done something with a little bit more industry, industry application, like something along drug discovery or like you know, organoid, organoid models or, you know, there's there's all kinds of like really cool, interesting technologies that are maybe that I, I, I think one fun, one way to think about it also is like, what are technologies that are kind of like sci-fi in a way of like, this could like fully transform uh, the, the future of how we do whatever, drug discovery, brain modulation. Um, but like things that, that aren't necessarily commercializable right now, but like in five years might set you up for a really interesting type of position, right? Because that's, that's where the future is going. So I think about it actually a little bit differently. Um, so yes, I think we all come into grad school with our passions and our favorite thing to do, but you're here to learn how to be critical thinkers and, and so, like you learn to develop the way that you think in your mind, right? So I actually think it's more important to be in a lab that is, a, has, is led by a solid PI that wants to teach you, that is invested in you as a person. Because ultimately, if you know how to think critically and you have the basics of science, you can apply that to anything. You can leave here, and if you want to do a, po a postdoc, you can go there and do actually what you're passionate about. And you, you already know all of the steps, the hypothesis, how to set up your experiments, you know how to do all of that stuff because you got that foundation in grad school. Yeah. So for me, and it's prob it's a little bit, it's probably a little bit of a personal thing because I, you know, just here I just lacked a whole lot of confidence, right? So for me, like I think that I just need to be in a really healthy lab, a healthy environment. That's that's. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Raquel's answer is better than mine. <laughs> listen, listen what to her. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same yeah. for school as well. When you yeah. think about classes, right. think more about professors oh, yeah. and right. reputation versus that really cool subject. Pick By the way, same book corporation. Same book corporation. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Always pick, pick the, the person. Boss, when they the mention like yeah. internal champions, sponsors, yes. the same as your PI. You want to yeah. have someone uh, very supportive yeah. who understands you as a person yeah. and want to develop you. I want to add one thing. So once you have that environment, you pursue what excites you. Like you know, um, yes. Nick said, yes. don't you first year, so you have five years yeah. left. You know? <laughs> yeah. So be ready. Um, the other idea is why you, you don't have to do everything yourself, right? Think mm -hmm. about the whole network around, right? The whole network of Greater Boston area. If you're excited by some technology. Can you think about any synergistic projects or ideas in a very supportive environment to pursue and explore? Mm -hmm. So I think we're all PhDs. We have this idea like it's like a hero, hero's journey. There's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Let's go tackle it. We have to face a lot of hurdles. We've got to overcome it and we're going to shine. You don't have to be that hero's journey. You don't have to get on that. And you can think about as a team sport. Yeah. Okay. And so the, just to talk about the whole champion thing, right? So when I was at UWR initially and they hired my manager, um, I told her that I wanted her job. Like it's one day, I was like, yeah, one day I want your job. And she's like taken aback and then I left. And when she retired, she called me back up and she offered me her job. And that's why, that's why I'm back. They hired, like I joke, I say they hired me off the street because I have no management experience, but they brought me back in because they saw me, they knew me, and they thought they, they understood that I could bring value to the to leadership at and I also think like that people first approach doesn't just apply to a PhD, it applies to every single job you ever take. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. I just want to follow up the people first principle. I would wonder what are the kind of red flags you see in, in a mentor? That the interview with or okay. so this so this, this is an easy one. Those, yeah. This is an easy one. Um, so so first of all, you want to make sure that everyone is productive in the lab, right? So you might go into a lab and you'll you'll there'll be like uh, everyone's talking about the nature and science paper that's coming out of the lab, but understand if there are five people in the lab, you're probably going to fall somewhere in the middle. So you want to understand what the most productive student is doing and what the typical student is doing. You have to understand the PI dynamic between that rock star and the PI dynamic between the average student. Because what happens sometimes if you have a rock star in the lab, you can spend a lot of time focusing on that person and encouraging that person and then looking at the typical student and being like, what's wrong with you? And that's hard, that's hard. So talk to the students that were, are there, they might not give you the full story. You can reach out to the students that left before and talk to them, talk to those students as well. You should also take a look at how long folks are in a lab, if they're having trouble leaving the lab. Because sometimes what happens, not, I don't think, I don't know if it happens here, but at, at uh, in bigger labs at like, you know, other IVs, um, the, you will develop in a lab and become very, very competent as a graduate student or uh, as a graduate student. And then you have trouble getting permission to write your thesis to leave because basically you have come in and you're doing a lot of work and you're supporting a lot of people so you kind of like trap you. Yeah. So look at those kinds of things. Just make sure you're talking, ears wide, o ears wide open, eyes wide open. Don't, don't gloss over that stuff. Again, you just want to be in a super healthy environment. You want, there are other PIs that say stuff like, you should be in lab six days a week. You should not be in lab six days a week. Do not go to lab on the weekends, right? So although like I'm sending my, my team emails on Saturdays and Sundays, I tell them all the time, do not respond to my emails on Saturdays and Sundays and don't respond to me after hours. Respond in the, in the daytime. Um, because I, you know, like I don't sleep and this is what I do, but I want everyone to have a healthy life, work-life work balance. Um, I found that every time that I would go in, you know, lab on the weekends and do all of this extra stuff, it actually didn't typically put me ahead and I didn't have any downtime to just be set over the weekend before coming back. So that's it. Just like just just go into the situation, ears wide open, eyes wide open, talk to people, understand what the PI is gonna be expecting of you and, and make sure that you can live with that. Also understand how they differentially treat people in the lab 
and make sure that you know you understand everybody wants to be a rock star but that's not reality you might fall somewhere in the middle yeah to make sure the pi fits you yeah. so true to what i've experienced in my postgraduate life i don't like being micromanaged I like being given a goal and then told to go off. So if I had a PI who was like, I'm gonna meet with you twice a week, I'm gonna you know, approve every experiment, I would have died in that kind of a lab. Fortunately, I ended up in a lab that was more hands-off and my PI was very happy to be hands-off. So I just went and did what I had to do, got it all done, did my own thing. I had a sort of a black sheet project because I just went off on a little tangent. Great, fantastic. Um, and I was, I loved the project. I was actually in on the weekends and excited to be in on the weekends because that's really what I wanted to do. But if you won't thrive, you don't like that kind of environment, you need to know that because you're going to be there a while. You want to know that the lab environment works for you yeah. and not just for everybody. Yeah. yeah. And you can think of it as red flags. I think it's probably more helpful to think about it. Yeah. I should say, what fits you? Yeah. Right? Because invariably, if they are brown, they are really good on some level, right? Sure, not everybody is the same, but they are really good and probably can provide an environment where somebody thrives, right? The question is, is that somebody you? Is that your preferred working style versus mine, right? Some people might be like, I want to work seven days a week, right? Because that's what they like, right? And they want a PI who wants that because maybe they put out a few more papers. Or some people might be like, I want more work-life balance. I want more hands on, hands off. What is the reputation of this person and does that fit me? I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit more generic. I think for me, I'm looking back on my PI, fantastic. I did a lot of stupid stuff. She was very happy with me all the time. I was texting her earlier today. Uh, I look, look really close. Uh, and looking back, you know, from PI, from my mentor at consulting, my mentor right now at Amgen, I think two things to look for a great flat. One, someone can value you. Someone can see where is your strength and they want to develop you as a person. I have a couple of folks uh, right now at Amgen. I don't work for them. I don't work for them, period. Uh, we cross our path a little bit on a couple projects, but they genuinely want to develop me as a person. They see potential in me and they invest time and energy and resource into me. I truly appreciate that. So that's a green flag. The second green flag is someone can be completely transparent and honest with you, especially in a one-on-one, -on -one, what we corporate call one-on-one, -on -one, but like private setting. They will, they will tell you, hey, um, you know, watch your back on X, Y, Z. You may have a habit of doing, you know, things this way or that way. You may, you know, want to improve on that. And someone can be very transparent with you, not in feedback, validation setting, especially I don't report into them. They have no say in my compensation and they want to give you honest feedback, that's another green flag. I, I take that as someone who has a genuine interest uh, to make me successful. Yeah, my question was related to like, the visa situation in, uh, yes. in biotech or pharma just because from what I heard from people like it's getting like less common than before. Like sponsoring a visa is getting less common in the one that it was doing. No, I, we're we're international so we can answer questions. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I can't speak to now, so my information is probably outdated. But um for me it was almost automatic I guess when I went to industry um it was more or less standard that after a year, so they work on the H1B, and after a year or so, they just automatically work on the visa. Now, I, I honestly can't speak broadly to how it's happening now. I would imagine that um, if I think about the cost of a visa and the cost of or the PNL of this company is, right, that's not even a drop in the bucket. So if you bring <laughs> the right skill set, um, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be almost automatic. I think the, more, the bigger challenge is just getting in, right? But I think once you're in, uh, yeah. So it depends, it depends on, I guess, a little bit more reason. My, the policy might change a little bit. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to, you can use your OPT for three years for sure. You can 
within that OPP, you can start entering a lottery or you can postpone entering a lottery to give you more years as a work experience, right? So um, the way to do that is you get that from people, you don't know, activate it. So if you get the uh, status change, and you can also, you know, the consular notice and the status change can actually exchange. So you can ask your lawyers to do that. So you can extend um, your opportunities, uh, lottery opportunity sizes by uh, uh, by using the full OPT if you didn't get. And then for each one of the most company, like you know, like most company would automatically just put you on the OPT. And as a matter of fact, a lot of bigger corporations they would do that anyway because at least in California, by law, they cannot dis discriminate. Uh, you know. E uh, by nation of origin, so they will have to select the best employee for that staff that's position. That's employee law, but that's different from immigration law, which is different, right? Um, and um, yeah, another thing to look at it, the way to look at it is if any smaller company or other company give you a hard time, your manager give you a hard time of sponsoring your H one B green card, are they really investing in you? Right, it's such a small amount of money you can probably pay out of your own pocket for sure. Like there's so many immigration lawyers out there. Just think about that. Yeah. But it's not gonna be an issue. It's gonna be pretty easy. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I think um, we're good now. So we'll move oh, that one. <clears throat>